1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Let me pause for a moment. <coughs> Has the Lord ever asked you to do something that looked too hard for you? Yeah. Has the Lord ever asked you to do something Here he tells Samuel to do something and Samuel says, how can I? Well, why doesn't the Lord ask us to do something easy? If you're going to ask me to do something, well, give me something easy to do. Like what, Brother Steve? Like, wait. Everybody say, wait. Like, wait. wait. Like, just have a little patience. Have a lot of patience. Why? Or something like, be faithful. Or be loving to hateful people. Why doesn't the Lord ask me to do something easy? Being quiet when I brother say something. How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. This, this is Samuel's response. You know who Samuel is? Samuel is a, a renowned prophet in the Bible. He's, this is Hannah's son, the one she prayed for. Remember? He's taken back to the temple and he starts to hear the voice of the Lord at a young age. This, he's not a novice. And he says, how can I? If Saul hears that, that I'm going, he'll kill me. The road from Ramah to Bethlehem passed through Gibeah. That's where Saul lived. Ramah. Saul already knew the Lord had chosen someone to replace him as king and Samuel fears that the envy that Saul has will incite Saul to violence so he's concerned Saul is going to kill him he says how can I go the Lord says take a heifer with you and say I've come to sacrifice to the Lord Go over there and have church. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You're to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come to the sacrifice with me. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons. And he invited them, them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel, he saw, this is verse 6, and he saw Eli. And, and he thought, who, who, who is this? This is Samuel. And Samuel, he thinks, surely the Lord's anointed is standing before me. Samuel thinks this when he sees this oldest son of Jesse's. And he missed it. Samuel misses it. In Samuel's own thinking, he misses it. You ever missed it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm guessing if Samuel missed it, missed it, there's a chance that you and I may have missed it. See, Samuel had 
Although he had been raised and he's a renowned prophet, Samuel had to wait on the Lord just like you and I are to wait on the Lord. Verse 7, the Lord gives him insight. He says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at things like people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse called Benadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. What's happened between the first and the second one? Something happened. He's gotten in tune. You ever heard anybody play out of tune? You ever heard anybody sing out of tune? Are you out of tune? It's horrible when it's out of tune. Say amen. amen. But when it's in tune, he gets tuned up. This lesson tonight uh, is to help us not to miss, not to miss what the Lord is saying to us. I've missed it before. Say amen if you've missed it. Amen. The voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord, he's not, the voice of the Lord is not being processed through human perception, through human vision, the eyes and the ears of, that are spiritual. And in order not to miss the mark, we have to remember that when we come up on these situations, these trials and these tests, or however you want to categorize that, we have to remember that it's not about us. It's not about our opinion. You know, a lot of times we'll say, hey, uh, my son-in-law does this. He calls me every now and then. And, well, we talk a lot. And he's got he's got all these ideas. <laughs> he's twenty-five, six, twenty-six. He's got all these ideas. He's got all these projects he likes to do. He's building a swing set now. He was ordering a part for a sprayer we got this week. He's always he's always got these ideas. And he calls me and he says, hey, I want to run something by you. Have you ever missed it? You ever, you know, when we get these, we get these ideas. And if we're not careful, and I'm not talking about swing sets and sprayer rigs, I'm just using that for a small illustration. I'm talking about other things in our life that uh, have a lot more weightiness than that. And in this scripture, which we have just read many times, this portion of scripture, even though, though the Lord had such a relationship with Samuel and Samuel with the Lord, Samuel's eyes got in front of the word of the Lord. So as close as we think we are, we had really better learn to process the word of God through who we are. Be careful when it, whatever that is, Appeals to your flesh. See, Elab, he comes before it. It appeals to our flesh, but it's not the word of the Lord. It's not the will of the Lord. Be, be careful when it appeals to your flesh, but it doesn't appeal to the word, the will of God. When you indicate, oh, this must be from the Lord, but it's not from the Lord at all. We, 
we think things, you know. Um, you know, one of the most dangerous things is when we have had an experience and we think that that experience should be applicable to every other experience. Well, I've been through this before, right? That doesn't mean it's the will of the Lord for that situation. Simply because you went through that before and this is how it worked. Because you might be just looking at the stature of the man. The, you might be looking at the degrees he has when the Lord has someone totally, uh, someone else in mind that you never, you never even knew, you never knew that, that could even happen because you're not willing to wait, do the hard thing, wait, wait. I'm not doubting your intelligence. I'm not doubting the years of experience. But Isaiah said this, Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Listen to Isaiah. He's speaking under the anointing. And he says, this is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts as the rain and the snow come down from heaven. And do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower, bread to the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's thoughts. How many of our thoughts are God's thoughts? Let's, let's back into that. How many of our thoughts are God's thoughts? How many, how many of God's ways are our ways? Or our ways are God, God's ways? How, how do you get God's ways and God's thoughts into, your, into who you are? It, it doesn't come by osmosis. It doesn't come naturally. It comes supernaturally. It, will, it requires focus of his word and the power of his Holy Spirit. We can have great physical vision. Man now has really from just 40 years ago, now man has reached a place in physical vision. There are all kinds of methods there are telescopes. I was watching some report on a telescope that they sent out years ago that has now found galaxies that just a few years ago they didn't even know existed. And in this, as I sat and listened to these scientists talk, they, they come up with all kinds of theories. Their thoughts of how, of how all of this got out there. I thought, how dumb can you be to think that you have some concept of how that got there through man's explanation? Because man didn't put it there. How can man explain that outside of the word of God, outside of faith? So man thinks he can see physically. He can physically man can see really far. But when it comes to spiritual things, the truth is, man just can't seem to see very far at all. So there is a group of people called the believers that the Spirit of the Lord lives in, and the Word of God is alive in them. 
Now I'm talking about a knowledge that surpasses understanding. I'm talking about something more than you realize because you lived a long time. I'm talking about revelation knowledge. Remember, if I say revelation knowledge, I'm not talking about a. I'm not. A, I'm not talking about fleecing the Lord and. Um, you know, trying God and whether the, the ground is dry and the wool is wet. I'm not talking about that. In fact, if you really, if you want to really know the truth, Christians shouldn't be fleecing the Lord. Come on. Because you have the if you have the Holy Spirit. All right. He's in you. He's the breath. He's the helper. So you're going to test some inanimate object. Compared to the living, breathing Spirit of God, you say, well, if they, if they call me by five o'clock, I know it's the Lord. Everybody say, oh, me. Fleecing in the Lord is really, it could be an insult to the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, you haven't heard many people preach that. We have the gift of the Holy Ghost. I don't need wet grass and dry wool to give me God direction. Huh? Oh, what I have, though, is the Holy Spirit living in me and the Word of God that I've sown in my life. So at that proper time, and I'm trying to get to where I'm going, he says, Oh, but my flesh, my flesh sees it and it, it looks tall, it looks handsome. But the Lord says, wait. We get in such a hurry. Oh, this world is in such a hurry. It's disgusting how big of a hurry we're in. Amen. Thank you. How many have the Holy Spirit in you? Amen. The Holy Spirit, has he ever given you an uncomfortable, creepy feeling yes. about something? Yes. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever walked in everybody else's fort and there's something going like, you should have stayed home, man. Anybody ever had this? Something's not right here. Something's not right. There's something I'm... The Lord is saying, hey, you walk in this, and you go like, well, that's not popular. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Joel gives us insight to the Holy Spirit working in the last days. This is reverberated by Peter in Acts, but I'm going to read Joel's writing in 2 and 28. He said, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. They will say things that are to come. You know the word of God does that? The word of God says what is to come. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men, old men say old men. Old men will, I will speak to old men in dreams. So I will speak, the Holy Spirit will speak, Joel said in the last day to old men while they sleep. I never heard much emphasis put on this in my life. And I'm going to emphasize it tonight. Old men full of the Holy Ghost, God will speak to you while you sleep. Young men will see visions. A vision is like a dream, but you're not asleep. On, on my servants, any servants of the Lord in here, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. 
Well, what is he talking about? He's telling us the operation of the Holy Spirit is going to bring insight instead of eyesight. If all you have is eyesight, eyesight is not faith sight. Eyesight is not insight. Most of us live by eyesight, not insight. Amen. I look like it. I see it. I like it. I like how it looks. That's why, and I want it. Come on, y'all. I know you're tired, but work with me just a few more minutes. Insight says, I'm going to go to the Lord about this. Amen. Yeah. Before I make a decision, especially if it's of any impact, I'm going to take a time of fasting and prayer. I'm not going to fleece the Lord. I'm not going to go with the, the wet wool and the dry grass. I'm going to, I'm going to fast and pray. Uh-oh. What's that going to do? What that's going to do, that is going to push down the flesh. The eyesight part has the craving. It's going to push that down so that now, as you have pushed down the flesh, the spirit, he comes up and he starts to work because you have subdued your flesh by prayer and fasting. Yeah. And now I'm not dependent on the dry grass and the wet wool or the wet wool and the dry grass. Good. Right. Good. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So David is anointed to be king. 2 Samuel 5 and 17. Let me read. New King James Version says, Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David the king over Israel, it prompted a response from the enemy. That's not a big surprise. The Lord does something great. Guess what? The enemy doesn't like it. All the Philistines went out to search for David, and David heard of it and went down to a stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephidim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, What did David do? He didn't sit down and plan, he didn't call his army together, he didn't have a boat. He inquired of the Lord, and he said, Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said, Go up. Or I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David went to Baal Perez, Perizim, and David defeated them there. And he, and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like breakthrough of water. Then he called the name of that place Baal Perizim. And they left their idols. And they left their images there. And David and his men carried away their idols. Now they ain't let them have a God to come back. The Philistines went up once again to deploy themselves in the valley of Rephidim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up at once. Circle round behind them. Come up upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the top of the mulberry trees, you, will, you shall say, advance quickly. The Lord will go out before you and strike the camp of the Philistines. Don't move until you hear the sound of the rushing mighty breath of God. Don't, hear, don't move to hear the sound of mul marching in the mulberry trees. Who's that in the trees? I got up this morning thinking about angels. I'm not a big angel thinker, but I got up this morning thinking about angels. David wrote this in Psalm 34 and 7. He said this. He said, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. Boy. Can you tell by the way you live that you truly fear God? Come on. 
Can it be witnessed by how you live that you fear God? I've got to thinking about those that live in the fear of God. We're trying to figure things out, you know. We, I was telling, I was telling Michael there this, this weekend. We were talking about, I was talking, uh, um, um, Sister Charlene. We were talking, and I said, "Do y'all know what the Ben Franklin is? How many knows what the Ben Franklin is? Ben Franklin is this it's a little business school for you. It's the pros and the cons of the situation. Over here, you're at the top of the page. You write pro. Over here, you write con. Pro is all the reasons why I should. And con is all the reasons why I shouldn't. Anybody ever done this? Well, if you haven't, it's called the Ben Franklin. Never knew that. Huh? Never knew that. Yeah, good. You learned something tonight. The Ben Franklin. I don't know if Ben came up with it, but anyhow, that's how I learned it. Always, you know, you ask me a question about construction. I get out, I go like, hmm, should I build this shop or not? Okay, what's the pros of building this shop? And what's the cons? Well, the cons is it's gonna cost money. Oh, yeah. And it's gonna cost, uh, this is how big I want it. Over here on the pro, I want it, you know, 30 by 50, but you told me it's gonna cost $25,000. How do I justify covering my tractor for $25,000? Yeah. It's called a bit of Franklin. The pros and the cons. <laughs> See, we're good. We're good at things like that. We're good at, uh, could, you, could you sketch that out, Darren? Could you sketch that out and show me what it's going to look like? See, we line it out in our minds of how we think it's supposed to work when it may not be God's plan to do it like that at all. So in order to hear from God, we have to step back. We have to wait. Wait. Look at you and say, I'm just not good at waiting. <laughs> Come on, one truth teller in the room. Look over at somebody and say, you know, I, I just don't like waiting. I just, I want my money and I want it. Wow. Wow. I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> when something goes wrong, we want it now. Yeah. We want it fixed yeah. now. Yeah. Right. As far as I can tell, the Christian's life should be crudely focused so much of our lives should be focused on God's word, listening to God's spirit, prompt us in the decisions that we make. If, I keep having this thought. I've had this thought for maybe a couple of years now. And I'll, I'll be... I'll be asking the Lord about something and I feel like I'm waiting on a bus. Anybody in here ever ride the bus? Raise your hand if you ever rode the bus. When I was a kid, we always stood over on the bus stop and you, you were desperate to get there and then you stood there and you waited. Can you see it? Anybody? And it's raining or it's cold and you're waiting on the bus. If you miss the bus, you're in trouble. You know, you don't get up on time. You're sleepy. You run out. Life is a lot, a lot like waiting on a bus. It's an important connection, but most of us don't have the patience to wait on it. But if we miss it, things are bad. 
See, when I got to the bus, I wanted to get there about the time the bus showed up. I stepped on the bus. Right? But you know, and it, it, I don't remember it ever working like that. I don't remember, I, I don't remember my spiritual life working like that either. I seem to always be waiting on the Lord because my feelings, my flesh have been so paramount in my life. You know, the things I want when I want them. And when it doesn't go the way I want it to go, you know what we do? I say, I, I'm going to use we, third person. You know what happens when, when things don't go like we want it to go? We get mad. Second Kings 5, I'll, I'll show you what happened to Naaman. He went with his horses, his chariots. He stopped at Elijah's house because he heard Elijah the prophet. If you go see him, he'd heal you of your leprosy. In fact, if you don't know this, leprosy is a sign. It's a type, excuse me, of sin. Well, Elisha sent a messenger to, to say to Naaman, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored as you will, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. He receives this message from Elisha's servant and he leaves angry and he said, I thought he would come out and stand, call on the name of his God, wave his hand over me and cure me of where I have not proceed. You know, back where I'm from, Verse 12, a band far apart, the rivers of Damascus, they're better than all the water of Israel. Couldn't I have just washed in them? So he leaves, he leaves mad. And Naaman's servants go say, hey, if you, uh, if the prophet had told you to some, do something hard, would you not have done it? How much more would he tell you? Look, is fasting and prayer, is waiting patiently, is searching the word, is seeking God through the spirit, is that that hard? Is that that complicated? Did that go over anybody's head? You don't understand. Well, Steve, that's just too, too deep for me. What does fasting and prayer mean? Uh, stay after class and I'll help you. But he got mad and he's still standing there with his leprosy. So he went down, verse 14, he dipped himself in the Jordan. He went down six times and he came up and he still had leprosy. Because you got to do exactly what the Lord says. Everybody say exactly. exactly. Oh, six times is good enough. You don't have to go down seven, but the word of the Lord said go seven. Seventh time, something happened when he's down there. He's under that water. And through obedience, when he come up, he's clean. Most people think going to church is shallow and silly. I really don't. It really doesn't take that to be a Christian, does it? Do you know what we do when we do that? We're telling God it, it, did, doesn't, it doesn't take all that. It, it's just not required. What's God doing for me? I sit here and I, I have these kind of lessons like this and go like, what's God doing for me? Well, God's taking me out of my way into his way. And he's going to go out of his way into my way when I wait and I obey and I pray and I seek him. God's going to go out of his way to show up for me. Amen. So hopefully we all have or will suddenly reach that point of not my will, your will. Yeah. Anybody ever tried to make you do something? Raise your hand if somebody tried to make you do something. Look at your neighbor and said, you can't make me do nothing. How many of 
Nobody's ever felt that, that feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come in here and you hear a preacher and he gets all over you, man. The preacher, he gets you. And you're sitting there and you're doing a little bit of this and, you're, and you go like, he can't make me do it. I can't make you do nothing. But I can identify the problem. And it's a, it's a life that is not submitted. Submission. It's like looking at your wife and saying, you're going to submit to me. <laughs> it goes off better if you let me read it to her from First Peter. <laughs> Get her in here. <laughs> Faith is not, I'm going to say this over and over again. You're going to come to me one day and say, I finally figured out what you were saying. But faith is not a one-time event. Yeah. Faith has to become your lifestyle. Faith has to become how you think. Yeah. It has to get in the conversation. Yeah. You ever had, a, you ever had a, a professing Christian stand before you and feed you fear? And you're standing there and you go like, Holy Spirit, and you're just going like, this just don't feel right. Faith is how you walk. It's how you live. If I say faith speech, you can hear faith. Faith comes by hearing. You can hear faith. Faith comes through this relationship I'm talking about with the Word of God under the direction and the influence of the Holy Ghost. Two more thoughts. I got to thinking about God is like a static IP address. How many know what I just said? God is like a static IP address. At times, back when I was working, we would go in and we would ask people this question. We would say, do you have a network? Most everybody would say, yes. And we would say, show us your server. So sometimes they would walk us back to a little room and they would open a door and you'd open the door and there's all of this computer equipment in there and they'd say, here's our server. Here's where it comes into the building. Some people would say, oh, well, we subscribe to a network service. And we would have to say that won't work because it's not static. See, if you subscribe to a network service, the IP address can change because the people that are monitoring all of that and the maintenance and all of that, they can change it. And it's not static. I got to thinking about that this morning. Um, your relationship with God has to be like that. It has to be to a point and a place to where it's static. It's not, oh, if I feel good, if I don't feel good, or hey, I'm up here, or I'm down there. It won't work like that. Faith won't work like that. I, I would assume we're all here tonight because we, we want to grow stronger in our relationship and faith in God. He's constantly telling his disciples, where is your faith? Why do you have so little faith? And by the time they get to the book of Acts and the Holy Ghost comes, you see their faith go way up. Because they had his word and now they have his spirit. See, there is uh, Proverbs 14 says, 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. 
even in laughter the heart may ache and rejoice rejoicing may end in grief the faithless will be fully repaid for their ways and the good rewarded for theirs the simple believe anything but the prudent give thought to their steps the wise fear the lord shun evil but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure is is the relationship with god is it is it really real? I mean, does the Lord really speak to people? You wouldn't believe how many people that get on the wagon so easily if you say, well, the Lord spoke to me. No, I, I can imagine, I can imagine at times uh, we can be like Samuel and have some type of relationship with God to where we have to go and say, Eli, was that you? were you calling me? And he says, no, but don't go back. Eli, were you calling me? No, go back, go back. He said, next time you hear that boy, son, go in and say, hey, speak to the Lord. So when you learn the voice of the Lord, don't ignore it. Be careful even when you know the voice of the Lord that you're all, always operating as the Lord would see it, not as you would see it. A lot of times people are giving me their opinion of how they see it, and in order not to start an argument, I have to remain silent. Are you right? Stand, please. I hope you got something out of that. I love you. Reach over if you can and get somebody by the hand. Muster, muster up that strength. I don't know what each of you are going through, but each of you are most likely, you. if you haven't been through something, you will in the future, you'll go through something. So before we walk out of here tonight, let's run something by the Lord. Whatever it is that's the need of your life. Whatever it is that you're troubled with. You, maybe you have to make a decision on something. Maybe, maybe there's a situation and you don't know how to handle it. As you pray, I want you to pray for that person with me. Father, we come to you tonight. And we hear God hear your word speak to me I prepare this lesson tonight I hear your word speaking to me hey Steve don't look on the outside I look on the heart I, I hear your word speak to me pray push your plate back pray instead of eat you've got something you desperately need to know or got a decision of your life or you just want to grow closer make some room for me so God as we stand here tonight and we, we pray for one another God I pray for all of these that stand here with me God we pray for your word and your spirit to fill our life and may we remember the words of the preachers to wait to pray to fast to seek your face to let your spirit speak through us Amen. For you are the air we breathe. Amen. We love you tonight. Thank you for your blessings. You're keeping us, bringing us. Bring us back in Jesus' name. We pray everyone said.